Welcome everyone and, and thank you for joining us today and welcome to our next uh, evolution of our social justice uh, forms and today is the black male experience. Um, you know, today we're, we're going to build on the work uh, from our last uh, forms and take a deeper dive um, into the intention into the intentionality um, of specific populations that we work with at our institutions, um, throughout our community, and so on and so forth. Um, one thing that I, you know, fittingly, uh, our country has had several incidents recently um, that speaks to why we have um, we have forms like today and why it's needed. Um, on March 16th, a series of um, shootings occurred in Atlanta um, that took the lives of six Asian women and two other bystanders. Uh, this attack, um, whether it's you know charged by race or gender, um, has no place in our society. Um, so right now I ask for us and all participants, if we could please take a moment of silence before we begin um, for the heinous acts that took place on March 16th. Next slide, please, Melissa. So previously in our social justice forums, we have um, a, a lot of you who have participated. If you haven't been part of it, we'll, we'll, I'll try to frame it out for us. Um, over the last year, we have had uh, several, con uh, several conversations um, beginning this work. Um, and the work really talked about the, uh, it started with the George Floyd incident about a year, um, almost a year to the day. Uh, in a sense, you're looking at about, you know, March 25th, uh, the George Floyd incident happened. I mean, May 25th, I apologize. And by June 2nd, we had our first social justice forum was born uh, where we had a conversation that uh, just to talk about, just to talk about it, right? With the things that are happening in our world, where we stand, um, things that, you know, why, why are we hurting? Why are these things happening? Why are these injustices part of our culture? Um, it became, it was a powerful, powerful, uh, you know, uh, powerful, powerful day that we had a lot of, you know, deep conversations. We had tears, we were laughing, uh, people were crying. Um, it, it just, it, 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 an event that was supposed to take only an hour and a half end up being three and a half hours, which was, uh, it, which was, it, it was, I could not, I can't even, still can't explain how powerful it was um, while we while we had this event, and and what it and what it did is it really kind of speared um, the rest of our year. And what we did is we end up having several social justice forums after that, where we talk about the intersectionality of race. We talk about um, anywhere from race, educational inequity, LGBTQ rights, immigration rights, um, counseling, and, and mental health rights, and we looked at. Um, as well as disability rights. And we look at the intersection of race within a lot of those um, groups. And we also spoke about women and women's rights as well. So that kind of set up the framework to where we are today and our evolution in it, where we're gonna start speaking a little bit more and focusing more on the intention of specific groups. And today our group will be the black male experience. And we'll do that over the next couple of um, forums. Next slide, please. So before we begin, I want to set a couple of ground rules, um, just so that way we are we have a, a, a good understanding of what these forums are about. Obviously, this is a safe space. These are um, an area where we're going to have some deep conversations where people are going to re reveal a lot of their um, a lot of their hurt, pain, um, a lot of things that they may be confused about. Um, there may be some individuals who are naive. Um, and, and or ignorant to certain things and those questions may come about, but we understand this is a safe space where we need to respect our different positions as we all have different lenses. We've all had different experiences and we want to welcome those questions and welcome people to actively listen and learn from one another as we, we grow. Part of this, um, knowing that things that have happened over the last um, year, um, we know tensions right now are pretty high with the, uh, the trial of Derek Chauvin um, over the murder of George Floyd. Um, and as that is happening right now, uh, as, you know, we want to give people, especially our students 
an opportunity to speak with someone if they so choose. Um, in the chat, we will share um, uh, our counseling uh, email for anyone who would like to speak uh, to a counselor. And then also, um, we will have private rooms. If you want to private message any one of us, there will be private breakdown, um, breakout rooms where you can speak to a counselor if something gets a little too heavy for you and you would like to speak with someone one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so again, uh, we will have the um, email in our chat and then you'll be able to either set up an appointment or you'll be able to speak um, directly in the um, private room that we will set up for you. And we have those rooms made up if anyone needs it. Next slide, please. Um, just to go over a few things, um, the way our the way the room is, uh, we're going to be set up with our agenda today. Our agenda, obviously, I'm doing the introduction now. Um, we will show a, a couple of short videos today. Um, there will be um, information that I need to kind of set up framework of, of the of what we're speaking about and looking at the injustices or the despair, the difference in disparities and and uh, educational gaps of our black male uh, students. Then we'll have our panelist roundtable where I have. Uh, several uh, um, individuals who are going to speak about their experiences. We're just going to kind of really have a barbershop type talk where we're going to just, you know, chop it up, have conversation um, and really kind of dig into some of the things that we feel or we, we've witnessed through our lenses uh, throughout our lives. Um, and then, at, you know, then we will have a, a Q&A session where individuals will be able to ask questions. Now, during the panelist section, you won't be able to ask questions or have um, an opportunity to do it at that moment, but you will during the Q&A se um, session. For, we want everyone to listen. So basically what we're doing here in the um, chat is you won't be able to um, have function of the chat or function uh, to unmute yourself because we want everyone to respect uh, the conversation that is being that is happening as these individuals will be front and center talking about their experiences. And then from there, we will um, open it up where everyone has an opportunity to ask questions. Now, I know some people may not, uh, if you've used the raise hand function, I know you, you can ask a question there. Some people feel uncomfortable, it's okay. If you don't feel comfortable asking a question, you can private message myself um, and we will be able to read out your question to the panelists. Um, you can also write in your question if you want um, to, the, um, to the group and then myself or Melissa will read out the question um, to the panelists or just in general, if you have that. And then we'll go over our next steps and then setting ourselves up to the work. Um, what we're trying to do with our uh, social justice forms is we had the conversation um, earlier on to set the to really kind of set up this work. This today we're kind of we're, we're, we're building, right? So these are going to be building blocks. So this part right now is we're going to have a, um, like I said, the open round table to really build and speak about experiences. So you as pr practitioners, um, as faculty and staff members, can pay attention to what's happening here um, and hearing about the experiences of, of in different individuals from different lenses. And then on May 6th, and I'll get back into that a little later on, will be the part two of this, where we're actually gonna do some workshops on relationship building and how to. And how to. So again, um, the, the purpose of our social justice forums is for people to leave here with um, an under, not just feeling good and having an, a, a better understanding, but we will continue this work so it can help you in your place of business, at home, um, just throughout your, your daily lives. And we, we really strive for us to have that. Uh, next slide, please. Next. 
Ask yourself why. These are the black stories we've been shown. A narrow view that limits our understanding. But there's so much more to see. Let's widen the screen so we can widen our view. Let's widen our screen so we can widen our view is exactly our theme today. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, we're in a Zoom world, so this is a lot different. And, you know, we've been, I think, you know, do we look beyond what is projected to us in, in our, what we hear, um, what is told through us through social media or what is told to us through, um, you know, what is told to us to, you know, TV shows or in our books and our history. You know, our theme is to really widen our lens and take a look at that. And this is why this panel was created today. So we can have a conversation and speak about those things about widening um, our, our thoughts and our views um, that maybe we have. If you looked at that video and you thought that there was gonna be a bad ending, why did you think that? Why did, those, why did those thoughts come across your mindset? Was that because there has been some things that have been built in to kind of have us feeling that way? Or is it some biases? Is there something that you, know, you may have not have realized? I mean, was there something built within you that you didn't see because you haven't widened your lens? Um, it's a powerful video. Um, and I think it really sets up the stage for today. Next, please. In, in doing that, we're gonna, you know, it, it gets a little boring um, in, in a sense of that I, I have to do this, but I want to set the tone by, by expressing facts and things that we all can kind of speak about. Um, in education, one thing that we, we understand is we can talk about gaps um, in, in our educational gaps of retention of black men and also about the, uh, the, the success uh, systems that are like jail to uh, from education to uh, prison pipelines that we have. These are all things that are in embedded in us. Um, but we don't talk about the gaps that are extremely, we don't talk about other gaps that we that are important to us that we can, can we talk about the numerical gaps, but we don't speak about the relationship gaps, the belief gaps. Um, the aspiration gaps. We don't speak about the engagement gaps enough, and we definitely don't speak about relationship building gaps um, enough as well. And today, you know, and, and as we will get into that, one thing that I have to do is set up the framework and kind of go over a few slides with us to kind of really build this in before we have our conversation. So systemic barriers in education, one things that we have an, an understanding of, next slide, please is you know, racial disparities, disparities in discipline. Um, black students represent 18% of our preschool enrollment. So let's think about you know, our students as young as they are, but 42% you know, of those uh, preschool students are suspended once and 48% of those students are suspended more than once of that 18%. So just think about that um, as, as we're again building that. When you look at K through 12, um, you look at nearly two times as like um, black students are nearly two times as likely uh, to be suspended without educational services as white students, 3.8 times more likely to receive one or more out of school suspensions as white students, and 2.3 um, times as likely to receive a referral to law enforcement or to be subject to school related arrests as white students. Next slide, please. Massachusetts, so we just kind of, so that's nationally. Let's look at Massachusetts a little bit. Um, African-American students have the highest levels of in-school suspensions and out-of-school um, suspensions. Um, in Massachusetts, Black and African-American students are tied with 
students with disabilities for the highest um, percentage of emergency removals, and that's you know being removed um, in many different ways. But you know you can kind of think of it as being by taken out by police and multi-race non and also with multi-race non-Hispanic students uh, with disabilities for the highest um, being taken out by law enforcement, as I just mentioned. Um, but when you think about multi-race, you almost believe that that person's color um, is black within that multi-race um, mix. Next, next slide. School to prison pipeline, nothing new. I don't have to really go over it, but we understand that um, school to prison pipeline is, is, you know, is huge in, in America. Um, these uh, zero tolerance policies criminalize our, our students. Um, minor infractions of school rules while cops are in schools lead to them being criminalized um, and their behavior is, is ongoing and it becomes one of those pieces of where that, that first little incident, now you have strike one and now um, you're, you're now building this resume of being a troublemaker where um, you know, and you might have just had a bad day in school. Meanwhile, other students are that don't look like you are getting away with that same um, issue, and they might just go to a counseling session or a detention. Um, I've seen it many of times in my work, um, and it's unfortunate. Next, you know, when we look at our uh, how we're overrepresented in prisons, this is something that is uh, that is phenomenal when you really look at it. Um, our black men and you know and and black women when you look at where they make up for our u.s population which is in green and then you in the blue line is where we are as far as our pres prison representation it really is something that needs to change and you wonder why you look at certain things of um, marijuana and how marijuana has been uh, one of those situations where black men are going to jail i believe it was like four times um, as much as um, white men, but when you look at it as, as a whole, they say the usage of marijuana between whites and blacks are the same, yet who is going to jail uh, for an infraction like that? Next slide, please. College readiness and disparities. Next, please. So when looking at uh, Massachusetts again and, and looking at our rate, uh, of ethnicity here. We look at African-American and black students who are looking how they're being retained at our school. Um, we have the second lowest graduation rate um, next to Hispanic and Latinx um, men, um, which is unfortunate and, um, and we will have our uh, Latin, uh, Latino male experience uh, later in the fall. Um, and I can't wait to, to talk about that as well. There's a lot there, but if you look at our graduation rate in the state of Massachusetts um, in 2020, again, it's not that, um, great, um, although Massachusetts does a little bit better than um, some of the other areas in the country. Next slide, please. So when looking at this, you know, research has shown that evidence of system, uh, systemic bias and teacher expectation for African-American students and non-Black teachers were found to have lower expectations of Black students than, um, than Black teachers. So keep that in mind as we go through uh, our conversation today. Um, students of color are often uh, concentrated in schools with fewer resources, uh, with 90% or more students of color um, spend about $733 less per student um, than, um, than, uh, than schools with 90% um, or more white students. So again, basically kind of breaking that down, I'm sorry, I, I, I jumbled that a little bit. When looking at that, you're just understanding that inner city schools or schools where there's high black populations, the resources and funds are just not adequate um, for those who are coming from more um, suburban areas and those um, private schools. Next slide, please. One more. So we're gonna go about higher ed um, um, disparities. If you look at right now, individuals at age 25 to 29, um, we have, you're looking at black men who have their bachelor's degree between that age, only 28%. Um, if you look at that gap um, of black men um, that in that same gap that have their master's degree, you're only looking at 4% of black men have this um, attainment, um, which is, you know, in education, we are looking at saying, well, we need to hire more um, educators that are black and more educators um, period that are of color, but if you look at the disparity in degree attainment, you understand why um, we are not so lucky in finding those individuals to teach our students. Next. 
So here's a, you know, this is a lot here. I won't read it all, but just looking at our, ret our retention gaps, um, when we look at, you know, study by the National Clearinghouse in 2017, um, our students, uh, you, know, you know, it showed that white students complete their programs and graduate at a rate of 62% while black students graduate at 38% um, within that time. And so there's a two year and four year breakdown. If you look at um, the numbers here, it's pretty staggering. This will be um, included in your, um, in your package that you get tomorrow for our newsletter. But you know, some of these numbers are staggering. You, know, you look at um, over the, the duration of time, how long you know, the, the, the gaps that there are between the two and four year students and their degree attainment and how many of them do not complete their degree um, it's pretty major here. And uh, again, as we go on, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this to try and save some time. Next, please. And then, you know, to the left here is, is, is pretty powerful. It says a majority of black adults say they have been discriminated against because of their race, but this varies by education. Roughly eight in 10 black adults um, with at least some college experience, 81% um, say that they have experienced racial discrimination. Um, so when looking at that highlighted piece and understanding is why is that happening and why do they feel like this? This is make belief. Um, a lot of times this year you've heard um, people state that you know people are race baiting or they're putting things out there into the universe that are necessarily true, um, but yet these individuals at a high rate feel that they're something that they're being discriminated against and why is that happening? Um, so if this is something that we are, if this is something that we're dealing with. How can we? solve this and bridge these gaps in, in doing that. So they, that way our colleagues, our friends um, do not feel this particular way. Um, and why is this happening more and more? And hopefully sessions like today will help in doing that. Next. So barriers, um, looking at uh, medical and COVID, if you kind of look at here, again, I won't go over it all, but um, you know, black uh, men and black people in general are having a struggle when it comes to anything of our medical stuff. So you look at unemployment um, rates and you look at what um, you look at our medical pieces that, that are happening, we are being affected at a high, much higher rate. Um, if, I'm sorry, uh, um, unemployment began to fall um, for most in June. Um, black men and unemployment rose um, and remained high through September. Um, uh, and then if you look at September, 12.6% of black men were unemployed compared to 6.5% percent of white men, um, which is um, pretty staggering when you think about it. So I know I just ran through that pretty fast. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to um, introduce to you guys our panelists today and get this conversation started. Um, so again, I apologize for really zooming through that and not paying a lot of time, but I wanted to set up the numerics that we know of. Um, I, again, I know our mutes are off and we all can't chime in. But I bet you that what I just ran through in, in a couple of minutes here, it's not, and we can talk about that, the, that stuff for hours, I guarantee that we um, pr probably already knew that. Um, these are things, especially in higher education, um, K through 12, those are all numbers that we are familiar with. These are things that are proposed to us um, by um, our school districts, by the Department of Higher Education, through national research, through many doctoral programs and doctors and keynote speakers have always addressed the issues that we are facing um, in, in our world today. Um, and it's no different at Bristol Community College or any other college around, um, around the district of these disparities um, and these numerical uh, gaps that are, that, are, that are bridged between our success, uh, success of black um, people in general, but black men especially, have been extremely hit with this. Now, we want to change this narrative today with our panelists to really start speaking about these. Yeah, those are the gaps that we understand. But the reason why we want to talk about our experiences is to get away from that numerical gap that we always talk about in our, in our meetings to really start having a, a better, deeper, widening our lens um, scope on inspirational gaps our motivational gaps, engagement gaps, belief gaps, and relationship gaps, and how do we build that and structure that in our work in order to be more familiar with a population that we may not you may not identify with, but how can we bridge those gaps? And this, today's conversation will hopefully get us to that point 
where we're able to start building on that and learning more and more about various groups. Now, I would like to you know, put in context and, and warn you that not every single type of black male is represented um, in this group. There are some people who weren't, weren't able to make it. Um, so there are some um, intersections that are not part of this. However, um, it's great, you know, our next conversation, I'll make sure and hopefully we'll be able to um, pull in some more views as well. But there's uh, so many different intersections that need to be part of the conversation because um, black males aren't just one person. And I think maybe that might be some of the issues that we are having in higher education in K through 12 and then through our community is that we kind of group um, black male as one and not seeing all the different intersections that we are. Um, so again, uh, today I want to uh, introduce to you uh, several of our uh, panelists um, from our communities that are uh, I've known for quite some time. I've either worked with them, they're good friends, I've coached some. Um, some are uh, students that I've worked with now, um, just to really talk about them and themselves. And I'm gonna have them introduce uh, one by one and then we'll get our round table conversation uh, going as soon as, we are, um, as soon as we are done. So first, I'd like to uh, introduce to you guys, Bobby Bailey. And uh, Bobby, would you please introduce yourself? Hey, how's it going, everyone? Uh, I'm Bobby Bailey, um, Minority Outreach Coordinator for Fall River Housing um, and CDA, the City of Fall River. Um, also a member of the Fall River Diversity Com uh, and Inclusion Committee. Um, Fall River resident, um, actually just relocated back to Fall River after uh, five years. Um, went to high school here, um, you know, middle school, and spent a lot of my uh, my time here as a youth, and you know, played basketball, uh, played basketball local Rhode Island, Rhode Island College graduate, um, and then I went on and finished my master's degree at LaSalle College. Um, so yeah, thank you, Bobby, um, Dr. Dario D T Henry. How y'all doing? I am Dr. Dario D T Henry. I am the director of the Trio Department at Bristol Community College, where we have three programs, SSS Student Support Services, Upper Bound, and our Talent Search Program. Speaking of that, shout out to Dr. Jessica Stevens, the Vice Principal at Durfee High School. Glad to have you joining us today. We work with her in our program. So I am the Director of TRIO at Bristol Community College. I'm also an author. Uh, my book is back there, How to Go to College on a Football Scholarship. I was a junior college football player. And that's where I met Rob Delalu. I went to a small two-year school, uh, raised, born and raised in Miami, Florida, left Miami, Florida, came all the way to Franklin, Massachusetts, had no idea why I was coming up here. But I came up here to play some football, left here, went to UCF, came back, got a master's degree from Bridgewater State University, got a uh, criminal justice, got a CAGS, and my doctorate from Johnson & Wells University in Providence, Rhode Island. I am also the host of the podcast Swag Bender with Dr. Daria D.T. Henry, trying to bring swag back into education. We're going to talk about that while we're on this panel. And I am also a professor of criminal justice, sociology, and recently changed 101, a race and diversity course for white and non-Black people seeking change. I'm glad to be with y'all today. Thank you. Thank you, D.T. Uh, T.J.? Hi, my name is Tejan or TJ. Um, I'm in my second year at Bristol. I'm currently in the liberal arts uh, sociology program. And um, I'm also a member of the basketball team there. I'm a work study for the Multicultural Student Center. So I've been involved with a lot of the events going on <clears throat> uh, this year and last year with the Multicultural Center. And I've got to, um, work with Rob and Melissa quite a bit. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Serge? Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Serge Beniz. I am currently a um, diesel services instru instructor at Greater New Bedford Vogue Tech. I am a father of four. Um, I am an immigrant. I came here at a very young age, so I had the uh, the benefit of going home and uh, within the four walls, experiencing the immigrant lifestyle, but then having the benefits of, uh, of growing up in America. Um, uh, I see Marcus Christopher joining us and Marcus was one of my middle school classmates. And uh, I, I think back to 
our school being very diverse, but Marcus and I were in, we, although we had a couple classes together, we weren't in the same cohorts and our classes weren't very diverse. So anytime we had the same class, we always managed to sit next to each other some, some kind of way, even though the, the alphabetical order never lined up, but we made it happen. Um, I'm, I'm also the um, co-president of our, of our union. And um, I, um, I think back to uh, some of this uh, stuff that you were talking about earlier with the statistics and you know you said it you know it can bore people sometimes but those statistics are so important for us to uh, to know and, and understand so that we can see uh, a different viewpoint and and try to really engage in, in making change so um thank you for inviting me to the panel um you're one of my best friends with the exception of the torture that you put me through when we go to the gym this is a very valuable relationship and i appreciate it well, thank you <laughs> Um, Frank. Hello guys, how you doing? My name is Frank. Uh, I'm a family man, father of four. Uh, my newest is uh, two months old. So, you know, that COVID was pretty tough going through that with, you know, wife pregnant and all that. Um, I am a Bristol alum. I also went to Worcester State. I graduated there with a health education degree. Um, I also work for Sir Jobs. I am a DYS job coordinator for them. And um, I work for High Point as well, where I do some uh, therapeutic mentoring. Uh, I'm a Fall River guy. I've been here since uh, 98, 99. Um, and that's, that's who I am. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Marcus. Good evening, everyone. My name's uh, Marcus Christopher, born and raised in New Bedford, Mass. For those who don't know, um, graduated from New Bedford High School. I um, started my higher ed journey at Bristol. I uh, went to Bristol for two years and then made a big decision and transferred to Hampton University. For those who don't know, is a historically black college and university. One of the main reasons why I did that move was I wanted to see students, staff, and professors that look like me to see, and it just brought up a big lens and it changed my life. Um, lived in Virginia for four years, graduated, found myself to California, lived in Inglewood, California for seven years, teaching out there, working with the youth, came back, went to Bridgewater, got my master's in counseling education and student affairs, interned, um, for the Chicago Bears, lived in Chicago for about a year. I found my way back, linked up with, um, with Coach Rob. And it was one of the things he and I had this conversation yesterday is just imagine how we all look out for each other and come back twofold. Because when I returned back to Massachusetts at the time he was coaching the men's basketball team for Bristol, he knew what I was doing with advising and mentoring and coaching. So to get my foot back in the door and to strengthen my skills, I volunteered and was mentoring and advising the men's basketball team at Bristol. And then everything just blossomed from there. So I'm just, uh, I'm glad to be back. I'm looking forward for this um, panel, this forum and to just to dive right in. And just for those who have some falsehoods or just curiosities about black males, I just hope after this session, those falsehoods are eliminated. Thank you. You know, thank you. And then so, um, so I asked the uh, panelists that we that we have here, we're going to begin our roundtable. Um, you know, you six can unmute your, um, I believe you have access where you can unmute your computers, and then we'll get going and we'll get this show on the road. Um, and I'll just kind of again, like, as we're doing, I don't want this to be robotic. This is, you know, so if anybody's not really, un really familiar with um, barbershop talk, um, in the barber in the black cultures, you know, barbershop talk is we go in, we have, you know, although I don't go to the barber anymore, um, we go into, uh, we sit down, we have a conversation and debates happen or think we talk about life, we talk about the struggle, um, and it's very organic. And I wanted to really have this organic conversation today where we're able to kind of, as professionals, as friends, um, as black men, just to really talk and vibe out for a little while, um, just to kind of really pull things together. And then at the end, 
Um, there'll be time for Q&A with some of the stuff that we discuss. I'll lead this, I'll facilitate this. Um, and then at the end, we'll, you know, Q&A for others that want to talk about different um, experiences. A lot of the individuals here are experts in, in of themselves. They're Black men. You can't take that away. There's no one can tell them who they are or what they've seen or what they've witnessed. They may have opposing um, uh, differences in, in where there might be in religion, it might be in politics, it might be um, in upbringing. Um, their lenses are all different and it's acceptable. We understand that. And we can kind of go back and forth with one another and then at the end, um, you know, dap each other up and then go home and then the next day have a, another conversation about something else. Um, and that's kind of like what we want to do today. Um, so I will start the question and because it's really uh, a heavy time in, in America right now, as we're seeing that uh, the stuff that's happening with the George, um, with the Derek Chauvin trial um, all over the murder of George Floyd. Um, myself as a black man, I, I, you know, let's, you know, I've been um, held at gunpoint um, many of times by police officers twice in my life. I'll say it many because one is enough. Um, what are your thoughts about the trial um, about police brutality, things that are happening right now in America, or this has, you know, that has happened in America. What are your thoughts um, on it and, and feelings about what we're seeing right now in this country? Bob, I just want to add real quick, you've said it twice, it's the Derek Chauvin trial. We've heard so much that it's, it's called the George Floyd, tri George Floyd trial, and it's not, he's, he's the victim. And um, Derek Chauvin has to stand and answer for his actions and his behavior. So I appreciate you recognizing that and, and calling it for what it, what it is. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that we want to kind of bring up, right? Because you know, and this happens a lot, right? Um, if a, a, a Black person is killed uh, or murdered in a situation, we seem to always find what they did or how, you know, you look at um, Tamir Rice, they're, you know. They, or look the other way. Yeah, you know, what's that? It happens way too often. We, you know, we become numb to, you know, reality and things that are going on, mm -hmm. um, particularly black, uh, black males for, for this discussion. And uh, too often, you know, we look the other way and we don't engage and, and, and talk about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you see these trials and things are happening. It seems like we're on trial versus the people who murder us or violently attack us or whatever the case may be. They try to find the stuff, you know, Trayvon Martin, they were looking at his, you know, Instagram posts of, you know, things that he had up or, you know, or Facebook posts or whatever it was and trying to really criminalize him to really make this, that, uh, that George Zimmerman dude look better. Why are those things happening? Why did, why are we painted in, in that light, in that picture? Why, why do you think the media does this? I mean, it's, um, it's, it, you know, you're right. It, it, it automatically gets resort to the to the past and you know what you've done um and it's almost like dehumanizing right because um if i feel like i mean for me you know it's been hard to watch it's been hard to even um you know listen to because the thing is is you know this i feel like there's always been a consistent narrative um so it's just like you don't know how this is going to play out but one of my and, and it goes back to like one of my biggest fears is like um, and you, you kind of get an anxiety about like um, it doesn't feel like he's a victim in this situation. And if it doesn't play out, right. Um, what's next? What's next? Yeah. yeah like, um, where do we go? You know, and, but, it, but it's tough, you know, and it's tough to watch. I mean, and even the first time watching it, you get emotional because it honestly probably took me about a month to watch the video. Right. Because immediately you, uh, you look at it like if, you know, I've, I've had uncles who have done, you know, 17 plus years. And, and then when you look at the crimes, it's just like how, right. And, and they've had addiction issues and stuff like that, you know, um, and those, are, those are conversations you have and they're not bad people, but those are the people you automatically see. So when you see something like that happens to a George Floyd, um, you know, that could be one of our uncles or something like that. Coach. Yes. Rob, uh, I just want to say thank you for having this. Um, when it comes to you know the trial and stuff, and and, and get into that, I feel like it's necessary for the plain and simple fact that you know if it wasn't recorded and it's not a big deal, 
we would probably forget it or move on as if, you know, it's regular every day and it's okay to do what, you know, what's been done. Um, so I feel it's necessary, long time coming, even though obviously things of this nature have been going on for centuries and decades, but uh, it, it's good that it's, it's public now. And as a country, I feel like we're more aware and from there, we can address the issues and, and really talk talk about it and see where we can go from here, if we can go anywhere from here. So let's, look at the, so let's look at the historical context. Why are we painted in this in this light? Why, are, why is that happening? Because a lot of people have fear of us, right? And this is why these things are happening, you know, this police brutality. People will always mention, you know, when we're talking about social justice and Black Lives Matter, and but they they keep stating like you know look, look what's happening in Chicago look what's happening over here or fix your neighborhoods black on black crime why are we and then you look at that video that we showed earlier and and, and then I know for a fact that I'm not saying everyone but some people in here probably thought there was going to be a bad ending to that video that was shown earlier why is this part of the culture that's that's paint that why are we painted in this light. Why, what, what, is, what, is, what is going on here? Can anyone speak on that? Because, because, the so, seed has, because the seed has been planted for so many years of the negative narrative of black men are violent, where just any, the negative stereotypes and through the media, through movies, through books, it's just, it keeps being renewed over and over and it's a reminder. And me personally, I just think it's a massive, it's part of control is of, just suppressing black males. And now it's finally being exposed. Like this is like from say 400 something years of captivity that like finally it's being exposed. So thank, so when Frank said that, thank goodness there was video of what we, pretty much what we saw were public lynching. Because if there wasn't video, it'd be chaos. But when you think about it, not too long ago, Rodney King, that was on video. He got his ass beat. The fourth, the three, four cops, they got off, got acquitted. So that's why I think this day and age with now all the ugliness and the racism is really being exposed. And with this younger generation and with social media that it's always been there, it's just being televised and, and it's disturbing. And, but this is the reality and we have to really, um, just really, you know, focus on it and just hold people accountable. And that's that's the main. You just gotta hold them accountable, and it just I just get real passionate about it. I just get angry. I just get frustrated, and angry about it because it's we've been going to, for you know for so long, and I just really think that and um this gen um our younger generation that that are protesting and marching, they have their major influence because I love it. When you, when you think about it, these young people, you tell them back in the sixties. You know, 60s, 70s, 80s, like they couldn't have resources, they couldn't have access to money, they couldn't sit on this butt, you know, sit here because of what they look like. It'd be all chaos. You can't tell them it's just just when you think about it. And it's um, and I just hope that Chauvin is found guilty in all charges because if for some reason, if he gets acquitted, it's gonna be Rodney King and um. I just thought it's gonna be like the Rodney King riots and Sorry. there's all right times 10. It's gonna be, it's all hell's gonna break loose. It's gonna, and I just pray to God that they just I, that's just my honest opinion. I don't know if anyone feels the same way, I but hope it this, doesn't this get is to the time that, now to really make a statement. This is the time now. What we're witnessing right, right now, what's going behind me. This this is it right here. This is gonna set the tone because if not, it's over. Um, yeah. Let me let me jump in here real quick. Now you said you asked. Like, why is this being painted of us? Here's the thing. America has to keep that narrative the way that they do because it's easier to eliminate certain services and resources when Black people are the face. Let me give you an example. If you look at poverty in America, if you look at photos before the 1950s, right, most poverty pictures are of white people, Italians, Jewish, Portuguese, all of that. You look after the 50s, most of the poverty pictures that you see are of black people. 
When you think of welfare, you think of black people. When you think of these things, it's economic downside. You think of black people. And it's easier, once you have them in that picture, you can pull out resources and say, don't vote for this. Don't vote for that. Because if we vote for it, then the black folks are going to get it. They're going to get these resources. And so when you put the black face in front as the problem, it's easier then to control the narrative. And, and, and like we said about control, right? So as you paint this picture of violent black men, it's easier then to suspend them in, in elementary school because the case then becomes, we want to stop them from getting to that uh, 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 super predator that, that they claim us to be, right? So what do you do? You show, and, and representation matters. See, representation matters on the negative and the positive end. You see a lot of black people getting killed by the police. You see a lot of black violence on TV, but you don't see the other side of that. You don't see the black folks that are researching dolphins and oceanography and scientists and all of that. You don't see that on TV. That's why it's there because it keeps that, it, it keeps that picture that representation matters. It's easier than to convict, it's easier to convict the next person if you keep it in the forefront that we are a violent people. And the evidence that we are not violent is if you just go back and look at what we got, what, what, uh, uh, Emancipation Proclamation. When they freed the slaves, it was more slaves than there were slave owners. See, I'm out the South, y'all, so I got to give y'all my <laughs> perspective. There was more slaves than the slave right. owners. Black people could have turned around and slaughtered all of them, but they didn't. What did they say? Let's work together. And what has been our constant narrative since we've been in America? Let's work together. Now let's talk about a narrative just a little bit more. White people get killed by the police too. But there's nobody on this screen right now that can name me five white guys that got killed by the police last year. Most of y'all can't name the six white guys that tried to kidnap the government. Why is that? Because the narrative, that's why. Keep it going. They keep it going. <laughs> that, 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 that's that's right, DT. Right, you hit. And, 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 you know, and also, I like how you said that. No, go ahead, Bobby. I was going to say, also, historically, you know, when we look at it, um, you know, because it's crazy. It took up until I'm 36 now to really start even learning, you know, uh, my own history, right? And historically, when we look at it and when we look at, um, you know, institutions and what they teach, um, you know, because if we go through, you know, every grade that I was in, in grammar school here, only thing I learned that a lot of black people were slaves and Rosa Parks just sat down and, you know, Martin Luther King. A little Luther bit King. about Martin Luther King, right? You know, um, but, but what about everyone else? So you telling me out of, uh, you know, everyone else is only like two or three black people who's ever done something and that was the end of their story. Um, so, you know, you know, just getting back to narratives and stuff, um, you know, those things are important, right? Because when we start talking about inspiration and motivation and, and things like that, um, we talk about our own neighborhoods. How do you know what to be or, or, or who to be when you can't see those things, right? Or you never taught those things. And, and then on top of that, how do you expect someone to fix something they never, they never learned how to fix? Um, I watched a video not too long ago and it was a, it was a panda that was in um, captivity, right? And it's just going around in circles and they let it go in a jungle and it continues to go around in circles, you know, and it's never corrected. Um, so, you know, when you look at it, how do you expect someone to correct some issues they never created themselves? You know, so stop with that. And I think, so I want to kind of, again, you know, because we're in a panel and we have this time here that I want to try to get through. And so we build up this contest. We, we spoke about, this criminalization of what black men look uh, that we see of black men. Now let's look at let's let's start moving into education now. Um, and as we start, look, I shared a, a stat earlier that you know our preschool students are suspended. Forty two percent of black male preschool students are suspended. Well, you know maybe K through five, and then forty eight percent more than twice in the times. That's half. That's almost half of our our, our babies who are in these classrooms. Why is that happening? And why is there so much conflict between our students uh, who we know that we raise them to be, you know, like ourselves, I know my, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, respect your elders, do these things, but then they go to school and all of a sudden there's this, there seems to be this conflict that happens a lot with our black male students and, and their teachers or their principals or administrators. What, what's happening here and 
what are some of the things that we can kind of talk about to really start having people take a deeper dive into to this diagnosis or what is what's happening? I think that there is um, that there are two two major pieces to look at. Um, one is the um, the the resources available in these educational environments. Um, so, speak just speaking statistically, low-income communities by result have less resources for their um, to provide to provide educations. This on top of these kids not being the kids having different types of academic learning profiles. If you look at statistics, kids are getting a, a lot of kids now have different learning. Um, I wouldn't say learning disabilities, but different type of learning hindrances and kids have and because of that kids have different learning profiles that aren't being catered to. So I, I feel like, and this is just speaking from experience, I um, spent my first six years of education in Bedford public school program. Um, a lot of a lot of the kids that I would see get in trouble were children of color, but also just seem to have underlying um, it, issues like ADHD, similar to me. My mom was my mom was knowledgeable in that field and got me the help I needed, and I was very fortunate for that. But I saw a lot of kids struggle and kids just couldn't stay still in their seat and a teacher's irritable because they're teaching 30 kids and there's two kids that are that just can't sit still and they're talking and moving and, and making a fuss while they're trying to teach 30 other kids and it's not you know it's it's not a good nurturing environment for kids with those learning profiles and then the parent the parents aren't given the or at least in the in the past haven't been given the insight into what may be going on so it just seems like the kids causing trouble and then we have this historical stigma of young black men because of episodes like the super predator with clinton and the crack epidemic and all of these past sort of media frenzies that surrounded the black community and you know the turmoil and it and it, and it only and it only compounds it and it trickles down into the into the education systems, which only, you know, I, I don't think has any real positive outcome to it. So, you know, TJ, I'm going to, I'm going to loop you back in in a minute about an experience because I know you have to leave to go to work. And so I appreciate your time. Um, anybody else want to, want to chime in on that piece before I go? That, that, uh, that pre-K statistic floored me. I mean, it, that's it, wild. It, it, it goes back to um, perception, right? So I can tell you in my experience as a high school educator, I don't have no stat to throw at you, but I, I would say at least half of suspensions happen because we're not able to manage that student's behavior. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that student's behavior is wrong, but for one reason or another, we can't manage it in our classroom. And so our solution is to get rid of the kid. And um, the suspension rates, Rob, I, I think go back to the first, the first uh, state question that we talked about, which goes back to how we're perceived, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that perception carries on into our, our daily work and it just creates this domino effect. And we have to, like, um, like TJ talked about his mom advocating for him and, and, and helping him work through his struggles. We have to fight for our kids. And that's the bottom line. And that doesn't mean that we're going to allow our kids to um, to do things they're not supposed to do, right? We 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 hold our yeah. children accountable, but we also have to uh, support them and make sure that they're that they're getting what they need as well. I can remember my yeah. son's freshman yeah. year; he was he was failing a math class, and his teacher was providing no support. She was just like, "This is what it is. This is what it is. He needs to do that." I went as far as having a meeting with her and her department head. And the entire meeting consisted of what Caleb needed to do, you know? And then eventually, I, and this is, I work in the building, I know these people. And so I sent my son back to his class and I said, well, the meeting's not over. Now we're gonna talk about what you need to do. And so um, I still held my son accountable. I let him know that, 
he needs to handle his business in whatever way he needed at the, at that moment. But I was also going to support my son and, and I was going to let her know as an educator what I expected from her. Hmm. And it's funny you say that I had my, my son was um, one, one day where he was in school, he had his head down on the desk and doesn't get in trouble. My son's a, a straight A student, just got accepted to every school that he, he applied to, never had any conduct issues, put his head down on the table, was having a bad morning. Him and his mom got into it, um, said he'll be okay. Next thing the SRO was called to, to, to talk to him and bring him out. Why? Yeah, you know what I mean? And then that's what my conversation was, why? Like, why does that happen? You know, and there's that, you know, why, why, is that this, why is that the next step? No one could have spoke to the student and set him aside. Next, now we have this thing. It, 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 goes, it goes back to not being able to handle the situation, right? So I'm sure there was, there was a question of why you got your head down or, or a, a command to pick your head up and get back to work. But mm -hmm. there's no, in a, in a classroom, a young man is not going to just come out and say to his teacher, well, I, I had a bad morning arguing with my mom. That's yeah. just not how, that's just not how we are. Right. So you pick a, a, a private moment to, to speak with that kid or just, I don't know. I, I can't tell you how many students I've sent out of my classroom, but I've said, I'm going to just give you 20 minutes to, to just calm down. And then you're going to come back in. You're not in trouble. Right. right. And then later on you, if discipline, discipline is necessary, you handle it. But sometimes those kids just need a moment, you know. It's so, definitely. It's it's wild because when I think about it, um, you know, and, and I think about these stories, and I I look across this panel, um, and even hearing it, how many of us went to junior college, right? Um, when we talk about resources, when you know, when TJ talks about resources, I mean, I worked at Durfee for a short stint. Um, and you know, prior to then, I, I I was there, but I worked there as a as a sub um, for a little bit, and then I, I worked in U Aspire helping helping kids access college, and then I look at my transcripts and I had a one point six GPA, right, graduating high school, and I look back and I'm like, how, right? I don't think I'm dumb, you know, in any means, or and you know, Frank Frank was is still one of my best friends, and you know, we look back and we had basketball scholarships and you know places we could have went and played. Um, you know, and I'm listening to, to people and, and then I'm, lo I'm looking at it and I'm like, why did I end up at a junior college, right? Still with no resources um, and no help. And then go from there to, um, you know, fast forward having a master's degree, but had a 1.6 um, in school, um, you know, but, it, and it's the same. Uh, I look at it as, as like, how are you teaching? What are you doing that's creative? Like, I mean, in all of our jobs right now, you know, if you have a job that's boring, um, you know, you probably wouldn't stay there. But we look at our kids like they can't survive in a classroom and they don't listen. But on a football field, they have 52 kids that listen and they fall into line. Right. So what are you doing to engage them, you know, to make sure that they're fine? What resources are you providing them? What are you setting up for them, um, you know, to make sure that, that they're successful? And I think that's major because when you relate to when you can relate to certain things and, and you can you know, set goals and teach people things, I think it's, it's a lot different. You know, me personally, I, I can pull kids aside and I've been in situations where I have real conversations. And one thing that we talked about, I hate hearing when people say, yeah, but you're black, that's why, and he's black. That has nothing to do with it, right? Um, because we can cross lines and still have those conversations um, with kids that are not black. You know, what's, what's important here, and I'm going to get back, I'm going to get back to that again, just trying to really get us moving in, in direction here. And, and we just, we're, we're going to talk about curriculum in a, in a little bit and how that is the things that we are witnessing and seeing through our journey. But I would like to start talking about our educational journey. And I'm going to start with, with TJ. Um, and, and what I want to kind of do from us is maybe talk about our perspective of, you know, what was our experiences like going through school? Um, a lot of the educators that are here on the um, panel, they're, they're here for a reason, right? They want to know, they want to bridge gaps, they want to learn, they, they want to like, what, are the, what is missing here? What are things that they could bring that they have an understanding that maybe they've not have realized when teaching a class or coaching or just being in, you know, maybe they're police officers when they're pulling, you know, when they're, when they're talking to individuals. We want to kind of, I'm going to dive into that. But my question for TJ is this, is like TJ, 
Um, I know that you went from the Bedford Public Schools and you had some issues there. You had a great advocate in your mom, but then you went into a predominantly white school. Um, can you talk a little bit about your journey, the differences and how you felt while being in that type of space and environment and recognizing self while you're, while you're in there? Yeah, so I mean, it was it was definitely it was definitely quite a change. I mean, going from from a school in the West End of New Bedford to Friends Academy in Dartmouth, where myself, my two siblings, my dad, and the librarian are the only other people of color <laughs> are the only people of color in the entire school. Um, it it felt very it felt very unnatural to me at first, and you know, sort of. I, I found myself really assimilating before I was able to find myself, so to speak, because it just, because it felt easier to just fit in. I feel like that, like, that, that's a part that, um, that some people, that, that a lot of people miss is that when you go into these, into these settings and then you go back home, you know, like my friends here would be like, why do you talk white? I'm like, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, and it's just, and it's just because of being in a completely different environment in a di around just really di a different type of language and developing my language to that level. I began to see the divide and it was, it was really hard for me to really figure out who I was because you know, a part a part of me acts one way for my friends at school, and then another part of me acts different when I'm here and I'm home and I'm playing basketball with my friends here. And um, you know, as as far as as far as even disciplinary, I, I remember in high school, this was this was in my junior year, I was in violation of a of of a few minor infractions, but just seeing the way that they were addressed versus, versus the white students that were there on the hockey team, it became clear that, you know, even like, even though, you know, we try to close these gaps that, um, you know, they're still very much there. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, uh, so, you know, what you just said is it kind of gets us into code switching and, and, and a little bit of that and, and having being two of you, right? And so can can some of our, our panelists talk about that or you know, maybe going in education of how you've had to kind of you let's know jump fit on this. Yeah, go ahead. Go let's, ahead. Let, let's get on the devil consciousness for a minute. Yeah. W E D the boys and the devil consciousness. So if you go back 1903, think about W E D E B the boys and the souls of black folks. And he speaks about this double consciousness that black people deal with. It's our two-ness. It's being black, but also being American. And so you have it's this duality that you deal with, right? And so what TJ is speaking about, and uh, and I'm gonna push back a little bit on something that was said on here, and I have to do it in the spirit of higher education. Um, and, and then I'll get back to what TJ is talking about. But as far as resources go in the community college situation, um, I'm out the South and football is a big thing. So it wasn't that we ended up at a junior college, we chose to go. I'm glad that we had the opportunity to go. And what I think we can add to that is to say that if more people knew about resources such as community colleges and junior colleges, then maybe more of us in our community would not uh, uh, miss out on the opportunity to go to school because we're always looking at the division one and division two schools in our athletics and our athletic play. So I appreciate the community colleges on that. And so in love, I just had to push back on the end up part. But the, what TJ is talking about on, on his end and that duality that we deal with is let's keep it real on here, people. What he's saying is as black people, we always got to ask ourselves this question of number one, how black are we going to have to get? And how black can we be? See, there's, there's a comedian out there named Dion Coles that made a great joke. He said, white people, you get to be white all day long. Black people, we don't get to be black all day long. All right. Now, I know some of y'all might act a little different at home than you do at work. But when are you ever in a situation where you think to yourself, I got to talk a little black today. I got to act a little black today. Everybody on this panel that's black, every black person on this Zoom call knows that moment. 
where you walk into an interview and you realize, I got to talk a little white today. I got to act a little different today. Why is that? That's what we're talking about. We need to be accepted for who we for are and who is <laughs> our natural being. Okay, and that's what he's meaning in, in that devil consciousness and that in that journey. So I just want to touch on that a little bit and then leave it up to the panel. Y'all can talk a little bit more. And, and, and that adds to stress because that's about putting on the mask and taking off the mask. And what I was always told, my dad told me this, you got to go into this world, you got to be non-threatening. And my dad was always was just like, if the white man has the power control, when you present being non-threatening, then you get the access. Once they, you got to make them feel comfortable in your space. And I was really trying to understand what he was meaning, but as I got older, I'm like, okay. And what Rob was saying with and DT, what you're saying, when we're in a setting, we have to maintain that professionalism because we don't know who else is in a room that is gonna look at us like, okay, is he gonna act ghetto? Is he gonna act hood? How he's gonna speak? And what TJ was saying about talking white, I, I went to Carney Academy with all the, and it was just, in elementary school, there was kids over. Why you talk white? I'm just like talk white because I speak in complete sentences. I use a subject and a predicate. That's white. There's color to that. That's proper grammar. That's what I learned, and I just it just frustrated me. And and I think that adds the stress of we have to have those two personalities. We have to act one way, but then when we get another environment, we gotta act this way. And it's almost even with dress. We fit it, um, in restaurants. I see. When they said, you know, um, you can go into a place and you have to dress, you know, uh, business casual. But I've gone to restaurants and I see a white person in sweats and sweatshirt, hoodie, sweatshirt, and jeans. I'm like, what? I got a shirt and tie on, but you got sweats? You know, but I'm just looking at, but I wouldn't dare to go in because I'm thinking, okay, they're going to look at me. Oh, he doesn't know how to dress. He doesn't know how to be pro. And that's just the seed that's been planted that always I have to dress to impress and hold this image of a professional black man when I go into a setting that maybe a space that they don't see black men. Mm. So if that, if that makes Marcus, sense. it's funny that you, you talk about dress because I'm thinking back to uh, Rob, I'm sure you'll remember, but um, I've been in a lot of places with Rob and we usually dress well, right? But I can remember going car shopping with Rob and he had on just a t-shirt and his hat on backwards and everywhere we went, no word of a lie, we probably went to what, three, four dealerships? Every one of them asked Rob if he played pro football. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> Absolutely. And Every that's single one, right? But just based on the dress. Now, we, again, we've gone a lot, lots of places together, yeah. and always dressed a particular way, and we get, we get treated differently. We, we, I mean, more often than not, we get treated like professionals because of the way we're dressed. But in that particular case, it was like, all he, all he could be because he's he's big and black. All he could be was an athlete. Yeah. So what what do you what do you say to what do you say to the individuals who will push back against what you just said, DT? Of like, no, that's more subconsciously how you're thinking. Like, you don't have to. You can act who you are in front of me. I'm not that particular way. I know there's people, you know, that are listening to this conversation or will see the recording. They're going to state that, that that's more of your, that's your problem. That's not me. I'm not racist. I don't think differently. You don't have, you could be you and you can dress or talk or be the way you want to be in front of me. That, that you know, what do you say to those? Yeah, I, 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 I'll definitely answer that. I appreciate it. So number one, uh, uh, the Hispanic culture, they feel this too. So I know there's some people on the screen uh, and it's called, they could talk to you about it. So you ain't got to just talk to me, talk to some other people. And the reason why it's become white becomes the standard. And it's not y'all fault. I want y'all to know that. Like, it, it's not y'all fault. Y'all, y'all too young, and I know, I know I'm younger than y'all, but y'all too young to know some of the policies and the laws that were put in place before y'all were born, and why we have this perception and all of that right now. So yes, like I said, a lot of y'all probably act different than, at, at home than you are at work. You're professional at work. I get that, but there's a difference between that professionalism and then that 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 culture that you bring. Give you a couple examples of it. So. Uh, 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 one person could be in a meeting and talk about a, a topic or an idea with a great amount of energy and they are passionate. When a person of color could do it, they might be angry. And those are two just two, two different perspectives of how they would just view. You can have that deep love for your position or for that idea, but you're just viewed a little bit different. 
Uh, uh, the same thing happens with black women. When black women are in a room and they and their energy rises up, then they become the angry black woman. All right. Instead of being very passionate about an idea. In a book I read once called uh, uh, Radical Candor, a CEO once said that a person, uh, one of his coworkers was giving him an idea and he got so passionate about it, he was almost yelling at the CEO. The CEO then said, I welcome that idea because if that person was so passionate about that idea, I should listen. So the other thing is for those that ask me about this in the audience, I just ask you to answer this question for me. What has been the best decade for black people to live in America? It's a 10 year period, 70s, 80s, 60s, 50s, 90s. And just that thought, the silence, what well, we all on YouTube, but just y'all be thinking about that, you know something's going on, something's there. And so it's not just that uh, 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 it's personal that I can act a certain way or not. It's I already know walking in what the perception is. We know that while it's something that you've been taught, don't act this way, don't act that way, don't do this. It's it's it's. It's when you're young and your mother stops you from crawling all over the seats on the train versus looking at the white kid over there that gets to climb everywhere and just walk around everywhere as if the world is theirs. It's just drilled in you. You better watch yourself. It's there. And so you don't have to, uh, you don't, you may not feel it for the white folks in the room. You may not feel it yourself, but trust me. All of us in here understand this, and, and, and there's, there's, there's some white people in here, you have a Jewish last name. And when you say it and people recognize it, they look at you a certain way. So you know that, y'all know it. So it's not just in my culture, but what happens is there's a certain standard that's set up. And so if you don't meet that standard, then you're out of line. And that's the issue. So can we talk a little bit about the standards and in, in, in curriculum? Like what are some of the things that we're seeing in in curriculum that really we, you know, so again, TJ spoke a little bit before he had to leave and, and he did a great job and I'm glad TJ was here. Um, but he talked about acclimating himself into the environment, right? To a different school, but we didn't really, we haven't really spoke about the books and, you know, we have a lot of professors and teachers here. Can we talk a little bit about that? Like the differences here and what are, you know, what are we being taught in the schools that, you know, a lot of our students who are young or our students who are, you know, uh, students of color, they don't see themselves in the curriculum or the stories, or especially in English and history. For um for for curriculum, and you know, Marcus brought up Carney Academy earlier. If you grow up in the city of New Bedford, there's a huge chance you have no idea who Sergeant Carney is unless you go to Carney Academy, and he is the first African American to receive the Medal of Honor. This is someone who's important in our history, right? Not just black history and American history. Don't forget about Dr. Waters. Yeah, right, Dr. Waters, right? So like, if you don't, but again, if you don't go to Carney Academy, I, I was a grown man before I knew who Sergeant Carney was. And I lived in New Bedford, right? Jabril Kazan, one of the uh, Greensboro Four, longtime New Bedford resident. You, you don't go to school learning about Jabril Kazan. You don't. So and, I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to bring up the, the whaling industry as well. New Bedford is famous for the whaling industry, but you're not going to convince me the little bit of talk we get about Cape Verdeans in the whaling industry is really what it is. Cape Verdeans are naturally fishermen. So you're not going to convince me that we didn't play a huge role in the whaling industry, not just a little bit that's, that's mentioned. Mm. Mm. Right. So, no, I was going to say, so I was born in Jersey and I came here from Jersey. And uh, when it comes to, you know, academics, uh, black history is, is, is definitely instilled in the curriculum, uh, 100%. Um, so I came here as an eighth grader and I went to, you know, school in Fall River. Uh, and I come from where I come from in my classroom, it was, I would say, 85% black. Mixed in, you know, we have some Hispanics, maybe some Asians and, you know, whites or white. I had like one, you know, one classmate that was white. And I moved from there to here, Fall River, uh, where it's like five black people in the entire, in my school. 
Um, and coming over, you know, people used to say, uh, oh, BFI, BFI. Um, and I'm like, okay, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. And I guess that was what, you know, a lot of the, the white people would call, uh, say to black people as far as black families inside. And the BFI was actually a dumpster. You know, it's a, it's a, a waste management company or something. So BFI was written all over it. So that's, that's something that I had to deal with uh, coming, coming from where I came from to Fall River. But when it comes to, you know, Black History Month and academics, like we had in Jersey, you know, Black History Month is almost like, I'm trying to think of something that I could uh, relate it to, something that it's, you know, parallel equivalent with, but I can't. But anyway, when it comes to Black History, there was a big, it's a big deal where I'm at, where I'm from. It's a big deal. Like we had to learn, you know, all about all the famous black people, whether Thurgood Marshall, Rosa Parks, you know, Benjamin Frank, all of them. We had to learn about all of them. And it, and it was and it was for the school. It wasn't just for the classroom, the entire school. And it was and it was like a game, but everyone was invested, engaged. So you learned a lot more about, you know, the black history. Here, there's none of that. And my son goes to the same school I went to. Go figure. And um, when that time comes around, I'm like, uh, what are you learning? What are you doing? I speak with his teachers, like, are you guys gonna, you know, do anything on Martin Luther King, Black History, anything? And they say, oh, well, the curriculum's already, you know, made. So we can only teach what they're telling us. And I just think that this area of Massachusetts or Fall River. They don't teach it enough. And I think knowledge is power. So for a lot of our kids, a lot of us, you know, we didn't have both parents, you know, we didn't have, our parents weren't, you know, the most educated coming from my household. I had, my mother never, you know, never went to college at all. Even though she wanted me to go to college and she made sure I did, you know, she never went. Everything that I'm learning in high school, she couldn't help me with. And I just think that there's a disconnect with the curriculum and, and what we should be doing as you know, teachers to help our kids. And that resource thing is, is real because you really don't have it. You just really don't have the resources you need uh, in a lot of these black communities to be successful as you wanna be. So but I'll leave it there. Yeah, so now so you, know I could, you know I got something. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. You know I got something to say about this yeah, curriculum. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Listen, the, the, the curriculum, you, you, children will be what they see. You got to have mirrors and windows, okay? And it starts when you're young. If you just think this black male experience, so let's talk about this for a minute. When you think about black boys in kindergarten, they're just as active, just as curious, just as, as motivating, they're moving just like everybody else. And then you look at black boys in, in, in high school and now they're, they're sitting in the back of the classroom, they're not as engaged, they're not participating, and then you ask yourself, what's happening? Well, you think about it. When you go through school and you start learning about the possibilities of who you can be and what you can be, as a black boy, you begin to ask yourself, well, where am I in this curriculum, all right? I mean, all of us are here, we're all adults. Can y'all name some black superheroes when you were watching cartoons when you were young? Probably not. So I ain't trying to, so I don't know if I can save the city and dash through the buildings and get and put my web up and all of that stuff. And then when I look at the curriculum in kindergarten and, and, and elementary, where do I see myself in this, in, in this, in these curriculums, right? I don't. But at any given time, we can take a black boy and show him himself in the creation and in all this in America. You can just tell that black boy to look down at his shoes and look and think about John Moslink who ever uh, who revolutionized the, the shoemaking industry with the everlasting shoemaker machine. Or we talk about Elijah, Elijah McCoy and the lubricators. Or when you talk about Garrett Morgan and walking down the street and look at the traffic light and all of these things that we've invented. But you're not taught that. 
And then when you begin to start thinking and start being a, a, a student that is more intellectual and, and want to go into things like science and math and all that, then you get hit with the, you acting white. Mm -hmm. Just gotta be exposed. You just have to, it's all about the connections. It's all about your network. That's why it's so important to have certain individuals that have that expertise that are willing to show you that, that lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just part because we're so because I feel the students that I've come across they're closed-minded, they're in a box because it's only what they've been exposed to. Working in when I was a therapeutic mentor for child and family services in Far River, some of the clients when I would take them out, they've never been to the beach. Like they really like they have not got outside that box. And I call it the me and my friend we call it the village mentality. And it's just like you've got to expand. And especially when I work with. Uh, Work with my advisees now that think about transferring and they want to stay in the state. I get it. But then I tell them there's 49 other states. Pick one, like expand. Don't be afraid to step out because you don't know what you can learn, what, how you can grow and just you got to challenge yourself. And it's just you have to be exposed, but it's going to take that one person to open up their eyes. And I think that's the critical part of the students that work in here at Bristol. A lot of them, they just stay in that box. And I, and I feel like as an advisor, it's my duty to, I got I to gotta open you up because I was growing up raised in New Bedford, but I lived in Virginia, I lived in Chicago, and I lived in Inglewood, California. I, I, so I tapped in all different parts of, the, parts of the country and it opened up my eyes and I saw a lot of different people, but Blacks, but a different perspective, a different lens of what I've always been taught of like, this is how you got, this is how we act. No, we don't. We're, we're, there's so, um, I met so many, you know, doctors and, and just, and attorneys, just different professions that you wouldn't be normally exposed to that we actually, scientists, just, just overall. And I just feel that we, our kids need to be exposed because you don't know what hidden skills or talents that our youth have. And once they're given that key, and once whoever has that access and they feel comfortable giving to them, it's endless possibilities. And I, that's what I feel so passionate about because they, I, me personally, I'm, I'm not the smartest in math and science. I've average grades in college and in high school. But one of the things is I knew how to if I was curious, I knew how to talk to people, connect with people. And that's an honest skill, it's people skills. When you have questions and you're just curious and if you'll come, and then the, it's endless. It's just, if you, um, and perfect example was when I was at Hampton, my, my passion sports. Sports is very therapeutic for me. So I wasn't on scholarship, I walked on for the football team. I got hurt. Luckily I didn't need surgery, but I was so passionate. I wanted to be close to the game. What can I do to be part of this game? So I was an equipment manager that opened up my eyes and it gave me, new, and my boss was like, whoa, I know someone for the Chicago Bears. It opened, I got an internship. Now I'm in Chicago and I'm working for the Bears for a year. Then I'm working in Washington DC for the NFL Players Association. I got exposed to that to see a different lens. So you just don't know once you get that opportunity it's endless. And that's why I've tried to get our students to understand that it doesn't stop hitting you. It doesn't have to stop here in this box. You can go beyond. So thank you for that. And this will transition because I want to get to the Q and A because I'm pretty sure some people might have some things that they want to want to chime in that we can answer. But I wanted to kind of really hit on this. So you, you're talking about success of our students and, and again, exposure. We have a lot of educators on here. How can these educators expose our students to these differences that maybe they are not really familiar with, can we talk real briefly about relationship building? Remember, we, we spoke about those five points of inspiration, motivation, engagement, belief, and relationships. Can we talk a little bit about how these educators can help these students, these black male students, and through their experiences while they're at these PWIs, um, the, which is, for those who don't know, predominantly white institutions, that um, how do these, how can these educators get our students to bring them to success and help them get there? Because right now that gap is so huge. We are all educated individuals here. We're doing pretty well um, for ourselves. We've gotten through it. Um, we've, we've been through it. How? how? How can these educators help? Um, can I chime in on this one real quick? Yes, please. Um, 
uh, relationship building with my students, that's, that's really the, the avenue that I live on, right? So as an educator, my curriculum is not the most, my content is not the most important thing. The most important thing is building relationships. And it's, it's not as complicated as we make it. It's not perfect either, right? So um, I'm certainly not a perfect educator. It, don't, it doesn't always work out that way. I, it not, I don't always get to build a great relationship with every student, but it's all about just asking questions and engaging with your students. Like I was having a conversation today with some of my uh, Spanish students. Why do, why do I know where Elvin works? Because I asked him, right? And so sometimes it's that simple. It's just engaging and asking questions. And we're so focused, especially at the high school level with our content and in academic areas because of the pressures of MCAS, we're so focused on that curriculum that we forget to just be human and have conversations with these kids and, and treat them like the adults that we want them to become, right? Don't treat them like who they necessarily are just in front of you at the moment, that's part of them, but see who, see the greatness in them, who they can become. How, what questions can I ask this, this uh, young man that's really going to um, make him think more about his goal and, and understand that there's, there's greatness in them? Maybe one more, just real briefly so we can get to the Q&A. Somebody else wanna chime in? I was gonna, oh, I was gonna listen. listen. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, was that I, was, I was just going to say real quick encouragement. I mean, um, you know, I think it's I think it's important, uh, even in my, you know, my my role now in, in moving out to California. You know, uh, I saw my first even taste of leadership and where I felt like I was a leader, but it was encouraging to have people around that were like, hey, you know, you're smart. You should do this. You're a leader here. Um, you're doing a great job here. Um, and I don't think they I don't think they hear enough of that. Right. Um, because I, I do think it's important. You know, people believe what you tell them, especially kids, right? If you if you don't encourage them enough or tell them things, then they just believe who they they are, who they are. So, somebody else was chiming in. I'm not sure. Did you have something to add, DT? Was that you? No, I wasn't. No, I just said listen. That was me. I said you know to teachers and professors, they could just listen. You know, don't don't assume. You know, listen to what they got to say. Take it for what it's worth. And uh, work with that versus, you know, having any predetermined notion of what you think is going on. Uh, just listen to what they got to say. Hear them out. Can I? Can I just? I just want to add another thing to that. And for for the professors too is, if a student's not understanding the content, it's not maybe specifically that they just don't understand. It could be something else that's blocking them from grasping the concept. And that's what we. And I think as as educators, we have to give them the coping skills and, the, and have them become more resilient. Because, and as they go through the process, because they're going to struggle, they're going to come through obstacles It's part of the process, but we have to tell them it's okay. It's okay if you're struggling at this point or if you're hitting this wall, but I'm going to help you get over this wall and I'm going to give you the tools and that's it for you to get over this wall. So then when it comes again, you'll know how to deal with it. And you're not going to, and that goes back to the retention because a lot of our students sometimes, once they hit that wall and they come hit that wall, they've never been taught how to get over that wall and they drop out and then we lose them. But when we give them those tools, so then they can get through the curriculum and know how to access certain resources so they can be successful and they and that builds up their self-confidence as a, as, a, um, as a student. So um, so quickly, you know, we'll, we're gonna get to the, the um, Q and A's right now. Um, and so if anybody has a question, you can raise your hand. Um, there's a raise your hand function. If you go to reactions and click on it and it should have a raise your hand function, you can click on it. If you want to ask a question, just send it into, um, and you don't want to say it yourself, you can private message me um, or Melissa. That is absolutely fine. Her name's Melissa Rogers, or you can message me. Um, as we are waiting for any questions that come along, any panelists wants to add anything through the conversations that we've had so thus far? Okay, cool. So I would like to ask a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. What do our panelists, or how do our panelists feel about uh, law enforcement? Just in general. Just in general. Yep. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's too sad, man. It's, 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 it's all, that's always, a, you know, 
it's two sided, especially at, the, at where I am now in my life, right? You know, just you know, I get pulled over and I can, I can have a conversation with a police officer, you know. But that's just that's where I am in my life. Um, depending on how I'm dressed too. If I'm in this, it's, it's one thing. Um, if I'm not, you know, I don't know. But on the other end, I always think I, I learned this when I was younger, uh, just from knowing a police officer. Uh, you never know where a police officer is coming from. And, and I think that's important uh, to, to, to say because uh, sometimes an officer can be coming from a violent situation. They could have had a weapon placed, placed in front of them, uh, uh, pulled out on them or something. And so at this age, I, give a, I, I, I don't react the same way that I would have when I was younger, but also I'm not always approached the same way. And that, and, and, and you know, I'm older now, I, you know, I'm, I'm not what I was when I was back, back then. So I have a, uh, you know, you, you know, my thoughts about it is, is, you know, not all police are bad. I mean, we know that you know, that's, that's, that's a given. Um, but I, I think the way the media portrays so many police officers um, needs to be discussed in, in depth. <laughs> okay, so you know, there's a lot in there that we need to talk about. Okay, I, I struggle with that a lot, Frank, because for years I I didn't have a, a huge I, I would say problem with police, and and part of that is let's let's be real, right? We have an honest conversation. Part of that is because I, being light skinned, I just didn't get harassed that much. That's just what it was, and so. Um, two years ago, I, I was pulled over in Rhode Island, had um, had my car searched, I was searched, and all because I had no business being in that neighborhood. That, that's what it came down to, you know. I was pulled over for a, a license plate being out. I showed him receipts that I just had my vehicle serviced and it wasn't mentioned. And I, pray, I basically stated my case, how do you know a rear light in your car is out unless someone tells you? And so... Um, again, but what it came down to was I was in the wrong neighborhood because a, uh, a license plate light being out should have never led to my car being searched. Definitely. So I have a question here. Um, it says, how do we as a collective, um, as a collective change the narrative that we can be vulnerable um, allow, and allow space um, to exist outside of a monolith? Um, how do we show up for each other and support each other, especially knowing that, that, that other isms exist within our own community? I feel like all too often we're so focused on what happens inside our four walls, right? We're so focused on our families, our, our children. And so we got to remember that there's, there's life outside of our four walls and we got to engage with other um, youth in our community. It's not just about what happens in, in your house because what happens outside your front door is going to affect your kids when they leave. And so, you know, as fathers, we, we do our best to set an example for our kids. And, and I know um, most of you guys are dads and I know a few of you are dads of, of black sons. And so we, we try to be this example for them and, and we're so focused about our sons but we really have a responsibility to look out for every kid in our community. It's just a reality and be an example for them and, and also be a support for them. Any other takes? I have other questions to get to. So no, thank you for that Serge. And I think that's, you know, absolutely right. And it's again, um, being comfortable, being uncomfortable, right? So we're in our classrooms we there are things that we are, um, we are, there are things that we just are not used to. Um, and, and I think that's okay, right? So um, I know as an educator and as a coach, there are many individuals I've had, um, an athlete who was deaf, I've had an athlete um, that were white, suburban, like it didn't matter. I've had students that were many different, uh, and I'm telling you, some of them are my, I mean, still talk to this day years and years later um, I didn't know what their struggles, but I allowed myself to feel uncomfortable to, to get to know them. And did I make mistakes? Of course. Um, a lot of them taught me things, you know. So um, what you're saying is extremely valuable there, Serge. Um, here's another uh, question here is, um, please talk about, bar um, oh, that's the, no, 
how do you respond to microaggressions in your daily life? That's a, that's a good question. I think, you know, for me personally, um, I'm in a, I'm in a different place now. Um, I try to address them a different way than I would have before. Um, there was, there were times that, you know, you get angry and, you know, uh, you know, to keep it real with you, you're, you're just like, are you serious? You know what I mean? Um, but I think now if, if they, if, if, if it happens, um, you address them. And like I said, I'm just in a different place in my life and, and I try to educate people as much as I can. Um, but they have, they, and, and they still happen. Um, but, um, I just think continuously educating and I have, you know, I have friends that are like, it's not my job to educate, you know, certain people, you know, when these things do happen. Um, but yeah, that's just my stance. Anyone else? How do you deal with any of these microaggressions that have come your way? It's, it's, it's all really, it's hard to answer because it's all really based yeah. on the situation yeah. of when it happens, how it happens, you know? I've had some people, like I had one particular person who's, who kind of, you know, rode that train and, and came out with the microaggressions, but I didn't say anything about it at the moment. A couple of days later, I handled it with a joke. He was having a conversation with me, but there's another, there's another coworker who looks a lot like me. So he thought he was talking to that person. And I just kind of said, nah, it's cool. You know, I know we all look alike and, you know, just handle it in a joking kind of way, but to let them know that like, I see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think he said it right. It depends on the situation. Cause there's yeah. some, a lot of times people just don't know some of the things that they're saying. And, that, and that's what happens. It depends, it, it depends on that, on the situation. Um, um, I'll give y'all an example of what I mean. So I was I was looking at being the advisor of the radio of radio club or communication club at a at a college that I worked at. And when I went to the meeting and I introduced myself as Dr. Henry, the there was an older man in the room who thought that I was a DJ. And he thought that I was a DJ because of Dr. Drake. Now it made sense to me what he thought. <laughs> It did make sense to me. And he was an older gentleman, he was an older gentleman. In that moment, I just gave him the grace of saying, no, I got a doctor, daughter. He said, oh, okay, okay. So in that situation, it wasn't, you know, in, 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 you know, trying to be malicious with it. So I think when you, when you said it's, it depends on the situation, it, it's so true because people, people, sometimes people say things they don't know. Sometimes they just, he, he might've thought he was respecting me as a DJ. When in turn, you know, I, I'm Dr. Henry, you know, academically. So, you know, situation. You know. Uh, um, uh, next question here. And, whoops, sorry, a little feedback there. Right. So, to, um, what are your thoughts on the 1776 commission executive order signed by President Trump uh, last um, last year? You got a nice big smile. You want to jump in? <laughs> if, 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 if no one here is familiar with it, you know, Google it. It's uh, pretty interesting. Um, basically, it's a setup of um, the taking like, some of the diversity initiatives that are happening in, in colleges or in education period are uh, looking to it was looked to be eradicated from. The, they wanted they wanted into, they wanted schools to really teach about the. Uh, miracle, I think they call it the miracle of the American history or, you know, and not, and exclude some of these, you know, things that are we doing right now. Wouldn't, if that commission is, is true by a college, some colleges will next that we couldn't have the black male experience. Um, obviously we have a great institution that support yeah. this. So we're able to provide these type of conversations. Um, thoughts on it, DT? I know you were smiling, so. Okay, so this is the thing. You know, we all gotta learn because it's gonna take all of us to fix this. Uh, Dr. Khalil Muhammad spoke at Bristol uh, recently and he, he said something that was great. Uh, he said, even if you went one for one, there's not enough black people to take over the white people's jobs and then you know change America, right? So we need everyone in this, as many bodies as we can to help us out. And if you can't teach people and uh, you know what they should do, 
and and uh, help them unlearn some things, you know, where do you you know where do you go? And and it's it's critical because you know racism in America, you know, it's, like I said, it's making us broke. If you think about it, no one in Minnesota can tell me again about immigrants or black folks or anybody taking money away from them and the job situation. Because of a racist situation, a racist act, that, that, that place is now paying 27 million. It was 27 million to George Floyd and his family. 27 million. That ain't got nothing to do with us. That's 27 million for a man they could have took for, for a family for a man they could have just took the jail over the weekend. A similar situation happened in Brockton a couple of years ago where a person at HR took someone's application and put it somewhere and somebody didn't get a job and, and, the, and he sued the city. And now the city might go broke over this. You know, they got to do something out there. They'll work it out. But if you think about it, racism is causing us to go broke in certain places. And for, and for someone to sit up and say, let's not educate folks, bothers me because if we don't learn to do better, it's not going to end well for all of us because we're all in this. And so I, I, you know, that's my struggle with that is that it, this isn't always about feeling guilty and privilege and everybody walking away feel like, oh my God, I, I feel so bad for what happened to y'all. You gotta walk away with solutions and tangible things you could do to make the situation better. And if you stop having the workshops around it, you know, then, then you're left with nothing. And then where does it end? Do we then stop, stop then teaching of, teaching men how to do better in situations where we have women in the room and in our, in our workplaces, do we stop that then? Where does this stop? We all need education, we all lifelong learners. Real quick, um, uh, Emily, you had your Hallelujah hand. hands, let's go now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right I I, I just had a quick follow-up question. Um, so the 1776 commission question was mine, and I didn't I didn't frame it very well. So I apologize. Um, I, just as a little bit of like what was going on in my head when I asked it was a reaction to um, knowing that states like Texas, like the big states, control a lot of the textbooks, and a lot of what goes into like what our children learn before they ever get to us in higher education. And, um, you know, Biden came in and he said the 1776 commission is dead, you know, this isn't going any further. But this manipulation of young people in their minds before like those of us in higher even higher ed even even get there. And I, I, I appreciate your answer DT because I spent a decade in Oklahoma which has some very interesting um, habits as well. Uh, you know, not only racial habits, but also uh, about Native Americans. Um, so, you know, it was more kind of like, I guess I'd love to know a little bit more about like how we as higher education, you know. Uh, okay, what can we do? All right, I, I, I got you. So here, I wanna say this to everybody. Number, there's a couple layers to this, right? Number one, um, you're not gonna save everybody. You're not gonna fix everything. So that's first off. You, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you have to do what you can from the space you occupy. Um, I would say, as as professors, when you're teaching, we all use examples when we teach. Look at your examples. Look at how many. When I teach my sociology classes, I have to make sure that the examples that I use are not all men. I constantly have to look at that because I have read so many books written by men and have done so much learning of, of black men that I can easily just come up with examples of two one examples. So I would say when you get to, you know, when the students get to higher ed, that's one thing that we can do. The other thing I would do is encourage all y'all to write books, to take out the curriculum books that are already there. Y'all are educators, let's get to work. I'm with you. I'll edit some people's stuff. For, for slight people. <laughs> so, you know, uh, there's a, a statement here I'm going to read, and then I want to just close up so we can get so we can close. And I just want to be conscious of everyone's time. Um, and and so it, it's you know kind of speaking to what your um, was um, DT, what you just answered, and to Emily, your thoughts. Um, and the conversation was here. Uh, college curriculum needs to um, it says here embed more uh, diversity throughout, not just Black history and Black inventors, but include like including math and science. So much could be say about this, you know. So much can be brought about this, and there's so much that we can add. 
the curriculum is more than just teaching about Black History Month in February, and that needs to be um, embedded more and more. And we need to kind of branch out, and that's a very great, powerful statement um, that I completely believe in. Um, as we're wrapping up here, and I'm going to get to our, our final. Um, can can any last nuggets that any one of you want to drop? Um, you have the stage right now, and, and maybe 25 to 30 seconds tops, um, just to kind of leave with you know we, these people have volunteered their time. A lot have left. But what's great about individuals being part of this is that they really want to make a difference and a change. Um, and so is there anything, any words of encouragement that you can bring or something that you would want them to take with them as they move, as they move on? I just encourage everyone to use um, your natural gift. As educators, we all care. It's, it's just part of being a, a good educator. So use that gift of, of caring for people to really just engage with your students and, um, and build great relationships. Thank you, Serge. Any other nuggets here? All I got to say is how to connect with the students going forward. Just talk with them. Meet them where they're at. And if you find out that this, they don't have the seed, then it should be, as an educator, your responsibility to plant that seed and then water it and keep watering it so they can grow. That's, that's the best advice I, I, I can give. Make sure that seed is planted. And if the seeds already been planted, just water, just keep watering. So they have all access. Thank you. Anybody else? I would say um, ask questions, but I would also like to add, um, there's no one way to do anything. So if you're confused or you're not sure, ask that question. And then make your, then move forward with that. I, I wouldn't say it's one way to approach a black person or a black teen or anything like that. I would say every situation is different, um, and you should be mindful of that. Any others before? So, I you know so before before I get into I want to show a, a brief video. Um, that, is, that is pretty powerful. And then I would go into our quick wrap up and our quick wrap up was just really talking about what the next steps are. And as we go into the next steps, just to know that when we started going into the intentional pieces of speaking about, you know, our social justice forms have been really, really popular, um, but our participation on the black male experience was less than the, all the other ones. And it makes you kind of wonder and think of like, because a lot of people, they, they look at it differently. They're like, why aren't we talking about everyone? Why are we just speaking? On it, even when we had some of our social um, justice posts, um, so I, I've seen some negative comments that were out there that people would, were making about it, and that's because we are getting to people, and that's what we want to do. We want the conversation to keep building, and I appreciate that everyone is here. Um, but before I get into the video, I want to really thank the panelists. Um, if, if everybody, you know, use their reactions and, and give them a applaud for spending their time and dedicating and, and speaking about their experiences and their thought process. And again, it's, it's all collective. And that's something that is um, powerful. And I appreciate you guys um, for this. And I really, really, really appreciate y'all um, for doing this. And thank you so much, Serge, Frank, Marcus, uh, DT, and Bobby, and TJ for, um, for dedicating your time um, to this important conversation that will continue to be built as we move forward. Um, so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna uh, play this uh, video and then I'll wrap up. And then again, just so we're staying on track on time, but if anyone has a quick question after, I still will be on if they wanna ask any questions um, um, as, we, as we go on. But here's a, a powerful video as we start going into our work and move into our next workshop, which will start in May. Um, please uh, think, about, think about this video for the next month and the conversations that we all had and think about the video that we started earlier about widening our lens and, and, and taking a, a broader um, a broader vision and, and uh, of what's happening in our world and, and really seeing um, what we can do as leaders um, to make this change and to get our students to graduate and to be productive citizens um, and do the things that we envision um, all of our students to do, so. Thank you. 
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without burdens. Let me work upon the waters wherever you want to call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. So I, I wanted to leave us with um, that as, a, as I get into the, or we go into our, our next steps and watching that video. And although it does bring in, it is a religious song um, that, is, that is a powerful song, but seeing the black father um, singing with the, the black son and then really expressing themselves. And as they're leading each other through um, all of the, the things that are out there, as we spoke about today with microaggressions and racism hate. Um, we don't ask for, you know, we haven't, our skin is our skin. And we, you know, this is something that we were born, born with. And unfortunately, there's these things that we have in our world that um, we can't, 
we, this is us, like we can't get by it. And as, as my son gets ready to go to college and he leaves my side, um, songs like that really, it, 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 when I say it hits me, it, it really hits me. Um, a lot of the guys I've coached when they're going out into the world or um, my friends and people, it's, you know, you, you wonder and you pray that they will be successful in the classroom. They'll be pro successful in their careers but we just want also for them to be successful in life and just going about their business in whatever path they choose positively that there isn't bias and discrimination and hate um, that they are given the same opportunities that we're all, um, that you all are given and we all should, we all deserve as we journey through this, um, through this world together. Um, a quote here, um, there's, a, there's a documentary Again, we get into our next steps. One thing that I would love for you to pay attention, if you have Comcast, um, there's a network called Peacock where you are able to get, um, where you're able to stream it free. Um, there's a documentary called um, The Black Boys Documentary. Watch it. It's very, very powerful. It really wraps up a lot of things that we, we spoke about, about biases. It talks about education, talks about sports and athletics. We didn't as many athletes are on this panel, we didn't have an opportunity to really even dive into that. Um, the quote here says, these young people don't need saviors, they need believers. And one of our, um, one of our five uh, gaps that we want to talk about is belief gap. And absolutely, if we believe in one another and we think that we can succeed, then those things will um, happen for our, our students and our generation and our kids. Next. Just to understand, we appreciate your feedback. Anything that we're at, we're sending out tomorrow um, our, our newsletter that you have access to. Please uh, fill out the newsletter um, uh, um, survey that we have. We just want some feedback just so that we can see where, where, where we're going. Remember, as this series builds, we're, our next set will be workshops that we will get into where we're learning about relationship building and engagement of our students, which is really, really important. Um, for retaining our students of color from BIPOC populations. Um, this will also help us build as we're not, as our black male experiences first, we will um, get into our Asian experience, Asian student experience. We are women, um, black women experience. We are gonna get into our uh, Latino uh, male uh, student experience. We're gonna get into a lot of work and, and nitty gritty and your feedback is, is extremely important. Next uh, slide. Save the date. Um, if you look at the upcoming social justice workshop, the Black Male Experience, this is our second part, will be on May 6th, um, and it'll be from 5 to 6.30. And again, this will be incorporated with breakout rooms. Some of the panelists that you see here will be teaching in some of the breakout rooms from their perspectives. Um, remember, this is a community event, so we'll have individuals who um, focus on uh, K through 5, individuals who focus on 6 through 8, um, 9 through 12, and in higher ed. Um, and we'll have practitioners from all across that will work um, with us in order to do that. And you'll have a sign-up sheet, so please do it. Tell your, um, tell your friends, people that you work with. It'll be a, a great experience for them. It won't just be listening here. It'll be a, more of an active dialogue back and forth. And again, as we, we, we understand that, that a lot of things have happened, um, Bristol has put our stop um, hate and, and uh, stop racism Hate and violence is something that has happened as I opened up today about stop Asian hate, um, stop hate in general. Um, it's really, really important. We stand behind it. I'm proud of our school to um, step up against uh, hate. Um, uh, there's statements from President Douglas that you can click on um, this link when you get the newsletter that will, will specifically speak to that. But I am proud that Bristol has um, been a leader in, in getting this information out there and we will continue to do so. Next. And then again, uh, as you know, as you all know, if you need any, any information, you wanna reach out, there's things that you're curious about, please, please, please reach out to myself. Um, um, there's our, uh, my email, Twitter handle, um, and then there's our uh, Facebook, um, Instagram and, uh, handles as well. So you can always reach out, follow us, take a look, send it to other people, we have a lot of great information. Remember the newsletters that we send out will continue this work. We won't stop this work. It will all, there'll be nuggets out there. There'll be things that we will share, things that even um, any of our panelists will add to it. You will see, you know, in this section will be, an, if 
if you know Dr. Henry adds some of his publications and things with us, we will share that. If uh, you know Serge in, in his areas and Bobby in his areas in, and Frank and any information that they will serve and, and Marcus and any information that they have, we will continue to provide that for you. Um, this is not just a one and done thing where you're done and then that's it, feel good. And now, all right, ready, go get them. We will stand behind you because we understand that this work is not easy and we will um, continue to do as much as we can in order to change the narrative, as we said, um, in, in the experiences of our students from BIPOC populations. And other than that, Melissa, you can stop sharing. I'm here if anybody wanted to continue asking any questions for, for a little bit. Um, I appreciate everyone. You have a great night. Thanks for being part of this. Again, thank you, Serge, Frank, Marcus, DT, Bobby, and um, TJ for being part of it. And thank you. Have a great night. And we will see you guys hopefully on May 6th.